We've talked a lot about the Cincinnati Bengals free agency hall, but now that we know who most of the signings are, has it changed the Bengals draft plans? Let's break it down. You are locked on Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Uh, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. We've been doing this podcast for what, four years now, James? And I've been doing it five. You've been doing it in cumulative six or seven. I don't know. It's been a long time. We've been covering these Cincinnati Bengals every day here on Lockdown Bengals. You can find us on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcast. Hit the subscribe button, become part of the now 20,000 plus subscribers on 20K, YouTube. 20K, and- 20K. Thank you to all who pushed us over that 20,000 milestone. Pretty cool stuff. And become an everydayer. Become a person who makes us their first listen with your morning coffee, your drive to work, whatever it is. Today we're going to talk about Trent Brown's contract. We finally got those details and boy is it a steal. How the Bengals free agency hall impacted their draft plans, if at all. And a bunch of rule changes and interesting schedule changes and things like that coming out of the owners meetings in Orlando we'll get to. At the end of the show, let's start with Trent Brown's contract, James. And this episode is sponsored by Game Time, where you can use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. The Bengals got more than twenty dollars off, I would say, for Trent Brown's services. This contract coming in much lower than either of us expected. Katie Blackburn was like, "Use promo code Locked On," and Trent Brown's agent was like, "You're right. Four point seven million is the max that that he can make this year with that promo code." So, turns out listening to Locked On Bengals pays off for everyone. I. Yeah, this this contract came out, I think, over the cap was the first one to have it. I'm sure there's others that have it now. But $2 million bonus up front makes sense. $1.5 million base salary, $250,000 workout bonus, and uh, a million dollars in in per game uh, playing time bonuses. Basically, hey, if you're active, you get that bonus up to a million bucks. So uh, wrap all of that up. That's under $5 million for the guy that, could very well be, regardless of what the Bengals do in the draft, could very well be their starting right tackle week one. And let's say he's not, Jake, and this is the beauty of this contract, let's say he's not, that's fine. You're fine paying that for a backup swing tackle that's going to be able to back up Orlando Brown Jr. and a rookie, it, assuming it would be a first-round rookie. Great value here. And uh, on the other side, I think Trent Brown viewed this as an opportunity to start for a winner to show everyone that he still can play and to join. I do think that the fit mattered to him. And he said that last week and the contract reflects that they didn't blow the doors off from a contract standpoint for him. And I think he did want to be here and it, it shows in that contract. That's what I thought Mekhi Becton's contract would look like. Brad Spielberger at PFF had Trent Brown projected to get two years, seven and a half million per year with eight and a half million guaranteed. Didn't come close to any of those numbers. One of the contracts that, and and I love Brad, have cited his work frequently. He was the most off on in the wrong direction. I mean, by comparison, he had Jonah Williams projected at 16 million a year. Jonah Williams got 15 million a year. Mm -hmm. The the guarantees per year are spot on there. Jermaine Illuminor got 7 million a year. And and Trent Brown got four four and change, 4.75 up to 4.75 if he's active for every game. That tells you that there's no market for Trent Brown. Or he really, really wanted to play with Ted Karras' blessing, Zach Taylor's culture. And and Mm. going back to Ted Karras. But like Chuck Chuck, Chuck Woma Okorafor, when when he went from Pittsburgh to New England as a cut player, only got $4 million. Trent Brown is a much better player when healthy. And, And there's an asterisk for that, I guess. Than, than a core for. I mean, in that sense, this is a steal of a deal for the Bengals. But to your point, James, that is swing tackle money. And and this is maybe our pivot into talking about the Bengals draft plans a little bit. There's one way you can read this contract, which is to say the Bengals are not investing starter level money there. They're planning to draft a tackle. And, and that's what the money tells you. Could be. 
I'm not saying that that's 100% the right way to read it, but I, I think that there is a fairly compel com compelling interpretation that is because they're only paying that swing tackle money there, that plan A for the draft could be offensive tackle at 18. Well, I certainly think they want to get an offensive tackle, a long-term option in there to develop. And whether that's round one or not, I think they look at this class and view it that way. And that's the other element here of why Trent Brown might not have had as many suitors. If you're a team that is planning on drafting an offensive lineman early, an offensive tackle early, do you want him around? Do you want to bring him in? Do you need to? Does there need to be a market? Like if you're the Titans and you really think you're going to have a shot at Joe Alt, do you need Trent Brown? Or do you just say, eh, well, let's wait? And, and so, yeah, the Bengals were able to get him at a value that you feel comfortable with him starting, of course, steal. But if not, you don't look at it like, oh, well, our big free agent tackle signing is rotting on the bench. It's it's actually fine if he's on the bench this year. <laughs> it's it's not a big deal at all because you're going to have injuries. We've talked about that, and he can back up both tackle spots. And I I do I will say this. I you mentioned the Jermaine Illuminor element. I'm just curious. Would you rather have Trent Brown at one year, four point seven five million, up to that? That's the the max, or the Illuminor deal, two years, seven per year. Either way, I think they're drafting a guy. Either way, whoever they draft should be pushing the guy that got the, the veteran, uh, whether it's Illuminor or Trent Brown. If you draft a guy, I think Trent Brown's contract is nice because you only have to deal with it for one year. Although I'm sure Illuminor's contract has an easy out for the second year. I, I wouldn't be, I don't remember, but that's typically the way these two year contracts work. Yeah. I, I, and, but the point is, is, People were freaking out after the Mackay backed and left town and were wondering. And I think they just turned to Trent Brown and offered him the same deal. I, I, I think like, Brad nailed that. I think Beckton balked at the idea of signing for that. And they were like, well, maybe Trent Brown's interested. And he was, and the deal got done. I mean, he was here for like 10 hours total. It was crazy. This was not a long Ruby visit. So, yeah, it's... uh it's good value, but to your point, I don't think it really impacts draft plans. It does give them the comfort of not having to take a tackle still, but I don't think they will flinch if the right tackle is there. If, if I were Tennessee... As in, as in correct tackle is there. Yeah, right, right tackle. If I were yeah. Tennessee, by the way, I, I would have done this deal for Trent Brown. Yeah, no duh. You yeah. brought them up earlier. I mean, even if you get Joe Alt, your, other, your right tackle is Dylan Radins, who's 300 pounds. I mean... Just to just have some competition in there for him. He's been up and down. He's shown some development in his NFL career. But I think the other thing that, that probably impacted Trent Brown's value is the uncertainty around the narrative coming out about him in New England. And, and he fought back and spoke out about some of the things that were said yeah. about him in the media. So the truth is somewhere out there, whether you believe the player, believe the team, somewhere in the middle. Dun, I think dun, that dun. The, the cultural fit is is... What's the Part X Files theme song? I, I forget. I, I that was like a weird Michael Scott Law and Order Law and Order improv <laughs> thing. Dum dum dum. Yeah, these are their stories. All right, go ahead. Wrong. No uh, one gets what the hell show. I'm saying. No. Um, X Files was like 30 years ago, man. The, the truth is out there. That, that's what, I remember that, but I don't remember yeah. the sound. The the, the theme. The point you know, is, I think finding a team that was equipped or thought they were equipped to to handle trent brown regardless like and, and did their homework and had to figure out what they believe the truth was about what was going on with him in new england plus the injuries and the availability i think that impacted his market obviously as well but like i said does does a swing tackle money tell you anything about the Bengals draft plans there we go the moment you heard it you're like oh yeah still nobody's gonna know what you're doing if you knew if you could identify from the, the notes James just sung, please leave a comment. But does Trent Brown's <laughs> money, along with the rest of the Bengals free agency draft hall, tell us anything about the Bengals draft plans. We'll cover that coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. And the truth is, is out there. The truth is with FanDuel. So whether you're betting on a big upset or 
on a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200 to use on point spreads, money lines, same game parlays, and so much more. You can even bet, of course, on who's going to win it all, whether it's the women's tournament, the men's tournament, all in one place, fanduel.com slash locked on. Again, visit fanduel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. So I don't get the feeling that you're buying this idea that I'm floating that that swing tackle money for Trent Brown may suggest that plan A is tackle at 18. I, I think that you agree that they want to take a tackle probably in the first two days of the draft. Oh, no, I, I think. I don't know if they have an official plan A yet. I think they're still evaluating to a degree. But what I think they they knew is that whatever plan A was, it can't be not having a veteran that can start at right tackle. Of course, and, yeah. And, and, and so that's that's all I'm saying. I, I, I think that there's, there's going to be multiple tackles that they're hoping are there at 18. But I also think that they would be happy about Brock Bowers being there. And they're putting themselves in position to take a Byron Murphy or a Terry on Arnold or a Quinion Mitchell. It, it, what, whoever falls to them. Right? And, and so... That's all I'm saying. I, I I don't think that they're going to be so zeroed in on on offensive tackle because of the Trent Brown money, but I do think that they because I, I think that they viewed him as a a quality starting option, and that's part of why he did sign here is because he thinks he's going to start. Could that change? Absolutely, and, and uh, he's not he's not flinching. I love that. I loved his response. Not at all. When asked about, you know, if he's concerned if they would take a right tackle or an offensive tackle in the first round, I just think their history of spending primarily for guys they're expecting to start and spending starter money on those guys, this is a little bit different. This is not starter sure. money, and and that's why it stood out to me the way it did, and and really suggested like uh, you can spend this. And if we look back in a few weeks and we say, ah, you know, that Trent Brown contract. We, we we should have known. Well, we've had the thought. We're not going to have that should have known moment because we've had the thought and it has occurred to us that that could be what ends up happening. Sure. I, I And I want them to be open. I, I would be annoyed if they signed any of these tackles. Illuminor, Becton, Trent Brown. We could go deeper. We could go with, with some of the bigger names. Uh, I would still have wanted them to entertain a tackle and be serious about a tackle at 18 if the right one's there. Yeah. If the wrong one's there, I never want it. There are some people that are so trenches, trenches, trenches. No, no, no. The right, the correct trenches is what I want. And yeah. uh, hopefully they can find that at 18 because that would obviously help them a ton. Now, did the Bengals do enough with their free Ooh. agency grouping to be that open in the first round? I don't think that they're open to every single position in the first round, nor is there value at every single position in the first round there's no first round running back this year there's no first round linebacker this year i'd be surprised if there's a first round safety this year not that the bengals are in the market for those positions don't do it in the first round <laughs> another safety if they take a safety with any of their first four picks i'm going to be annoyed i don't care how good he is first four yeah because the fourth is now the, the 97th pick and not the fourth yes. round pick yes yeah. so uh, first two days if we're talking yeah. about a safety we, I'm I mean, gonna be we were, and it's and it's nothing against that player, but I will be annoyed. And yeah, we, were we were surprised, surprised last year, yeah. and turns out the Bengals are smarter than us, which is great. I love it when the Bengals are smarter than us. I agree. I I think battle helped, of course. I don't know now. It yeah, is it going to play this year? <laughs> they're <safe, laughs> easy. They're for, uh, I, I don't know if they're smarter. A Dewan Jones Trent Brown combo. Yeah, completely. You know, I don't know. I, uh, Anyway, can you imagine that kind of beef? Three guys over a thousand pounds. Would they actually? Yeah, they would. Oh, without even, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah, pretty easy. Any of their three linemen, if you combine the two Browns, is over a thousand because yeah, the I other guys so. are 300. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, did the Bengals do enough to be that open in the first round to the positions where the value will be there? They still need a corner. I don't think they're going to press for a corner. They still need a defensive tackle. 
They, you could argue, still need an offensive tackle, certainly for the long term, need a right tackle. Are any of those needs still burning enough that you think the Bengals are are forcing one of those positions? You know, where, where value takes them away from the the correct player. Is there a reach coming? I don't think so. Would you rather? Enough. Well, would you rather them if they did go out and dip their toe in a free agency again? Bring in Tier Tart and sign him, or sign Stefan Gilmore. Ignore the contract part of it because we just don't, though they would be different contract wise, of course. Probably Gilmore because you have a couple of potential long term pieces still wow. at okay. corner. And I don't love, like, if Terry, if, if uh, Arnold or Mitchell, like, fine with either of them, don't think either of them are going to be available to you at 18. And the opportunity to instead go for one of these top end tackles or top end defensive tackles is more appealing to me. Maybe just because the Bengals drafted all those corners for that stretch of years that one time in the first round, but he would be that one year option to let you figure out. Do we have long-term corners in Cam Taylor, Britton, DJ Turner? And and then they can figure it out next year. Whereas Tio Tart is probably a bit more of a commitment. That's, that's my well, thought process. Is he? Probably. Just a one, he, I think he's a one-year player at this stage. I think they're all one-year Maybe. players. Are there Maybe. any multi-year players left? could be two years for Tier Tart, which is effectively one year with a little buyout, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, Sheldon Rankins is a one-year. You really look at it. I don't think it will be, but it could be. Anyways, uh, I, I don't think they're in position, or, or I think that they will get themselves, and maybe by the time people listen to this, put themselves in position to where they don't have to force it at any spot. But Quinion Mitchell, Terry and Arnold, I think very much in the running to be pick 18. Brock Bowers, very much in the running to be pick 18. Like these non-trench picks, there's at least three. I don't know how they feel about Brian Thomas Jr. yet. I've always kind of felt like wide receiver in round one doesn't line up with what they'll do. I've always, really recently at least, said round two feels like the sweet spot. We'll see. Maybe they don't feel that way. But I, I do think they'll add defensive line help. I do think that they'll add offensive tackle help and in offensive line help in general. But, man, they, they still have a little money to spend, Jake. And so I, I do think that at least a corner is coming. and Maybe, maybe a Josh Tupo or somebody. Someone in that defensive tackle room. Yeah, Tupo would be essentially free from a cap space perspective. Anybody they sign at this point pushes $915,000 off of the top 53. And so hey, if, they sign a, if they sign a guy for like vet minimum 1.2 or whatever, that's a net $300,000 cap hit. They could essentially sign infinite vet minimum type guys at this point and bring them in for training camp if that's what they wanted to do. To from 90. A, to, to 90 yeah because you need then they would have to start cutting guys to the maximum of 90 but would you sign today sure would you fly okay of course it's a lot of money okay. um the bengals have in, in my math anyway since we're on the topic of the cap about 14 and a half million dollars in cap space to use after accounting for practice squad after accounting for rookie cap hits that are going to displace some more money off but the, the instead of top 51 or top 53 or whatever you see on your favorite cap tracking website, you really should be doing top 69. Nice uh, cap math because the 16 player practice squad plus 53 player active roster is what the Bengals are going to be accounting for. And, and practice squad cap hits do count. So that's where I'm at for the Bengals cap space. Evan McPherson extension, a little bit of money for injury reserve because the Bengals don't do in season restructures. They could probably fit a few other like $3 million contracts in there if they wanted to, and we'll see if they want to. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if they want to. We'll see if maybe they are they have their eyes peeled for a kickoff returner. What do you mean kickoff returner? A kickoff returner. We'll get to those details and why they should draft Malachi Corley. No, Malachi Corley will stay for another day, but we'll get to the new kickoff rules coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Opening day is this week. It's a holiday in the Queen City. You know that. I know that. Jake knows that as a Cincinnati native. Everyone asks you, ask me, by the way, where you're from. He's from Cincinnati. He went to Princeton. And opening day is a holiday for him, too. And so if you're trying to get tickets to opening day, how do you do it? 
but you do it with game time because they're going to have those last minute tickets. They're going to have flash deals. They're going to have the best value so you can get into great American ballpark and watch the Reds hopefully dismantle the Washington Nationals on Thursday. And the beauty about game time is it's an upfront price. You're not going to get all these hidden fees that you get hit with as you go to check out. And you're also going to be able to see the view from your seat before you purchase those tickets so you know exactly what you're getting. Save $20 off your first purchase right now by downloading the Game Time app and using promo code Locked On. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for $20 off in the Game Time app. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. The NFL has adopted the XFL's kickoff rule with some minor changes. But to your point, James, before we transition to this topic, do the Bengals need to upgrade kickoff returner? They've got the kicker, and we'll find out how precise Evan McPherson can be on kickoffs because I think, and we'll talk about kickers as well, dropping kicks between the one and five yard line on kickoffs is now a potentially highly sought after skill for, for kickers in the NFL. But the other side of this is, if you have an elite return man, that makes life pretty difficult in terms of decision making for the other team. Do you want to attempt fate with return possibilities, putting the kickoff returnable? Because now in the new rule, if the ball rolls into the end zone, it's a touchback to the 20. So any kick in the field of play, teams are going to want to return. If the ball flies into the end zone on the fly, the touchback goes out to the 30 yard line. And they've done some other changes to compress the space players are running to try to reduce impact injuries in the run-up that that they've been trying to solve for a while. But the XFL like leader with 10 plus kickoff returns in kickoff return average is actually Puka Williams. Shout out former Bengal Puka Williams, 29, Mm -hmm. I think, yards per return. Mm -hmm. If you have a really good returner, you could really win five, six, seven yards of field position on average per starting drive for your team. Puka Williams, you are a Bengal. There we go. Make the call. Bring him back. No, I I think the the NFL is trying to make the kickoff matter again. And so I, I like the idea and I hope it works and I hope we see more kickoffs. I hope that kickoffs aren't me getting up in the press box and all right, this is a good bathroom break. All right, I'm good. I, I want to be able to have a play that matters, right? And it is good to have that break, of course. But there are other breaks while you're watching at home or whatever the case is. I The kickoff mattering is cool. And growing up, the guy who made kickoffs pretty fun, Tab Perry. Everybody, Anybody remember Tab Perry? He had some pretty big kickoffs uh, for the Bengals kickoff return. So to me, having a guy like that, Kiwan Ratliff had a couple. Maybe it was punts for Kiwan. The, the point is, is having that play matter makes the game better. And if you can do it in a safe way where it's safer for players too, which clearly the NFL is worried about from a kickoff standpoint, then let's do that. Because just having a guy kick it to the back of the end zone and then starting at the 20, well, that's what we've seen. And so hopefully now there's some strategy involved. And if not, and teams want to do that, but you're going to put Joe Burrow on the 30 yard line every time, which the Bengals will take. Yeah. I think that that little bit of field position difference could matter. I mean, especially at the end of game situations where, you know, you're at the 30 instead of the 25, that five yards for a field goal could be, could be paramount importance at at the end of games. And and having Evan McPherson too, right. It it, it puts some pressure at at the end of games. You don't want to give up an extra seven yards because if you get him to the 40, that that could be the difference. So it's, it is interesting. And Darren Simmons was a part of this. By the way, he we we talked to him at the combine about this. He was part of the committee that that's trying to figure out how to make it matter again. And I do think that the Bengals, when they're drafting a receiver, when they're drafting a corner, when they're looking at running back, that will certainly be something that they take into consideration, especially with all those late day three picks. Has this guy returned before? Can he contribute on special teams in that area? I, I do think that that matters. You get to bring back the consternation over keeping guys like Brandon Tate on the roster for years because they can stop return the kids. Tate hate. Even though okay? every, it's not uh, Bengals fans love to hate that guy. I know, and I'm telling you to stop it. All right, see, this is how far Locked On Bengals goes back. There was a stop the Tate hate episode. <laughs> Better believe it. Before Alex uh, Erickson made the team and beat him out. 
The Bengals could use an improvement at that position. I think Travion Williams and, and Chris Evans are both pretty natural returners, seeing both of yeah. those guys do it when they did have opportunities. So they could do worse, but neither of those guys, I think, are, are terrifying kickoff teams either. Chris, Chris, uh, Chris Evans has a better chance of doing so because – the tested athleticism for him shows a more explosive player, but th this does change the way you're building rosters a little bit because you have shorter areas. So how does that change the players you're putting on the field? You want bigger guys that don't need, you know, you don't need as much speed. You want guys that are going to be able to take on blocks in short areas. Do you, do you build your team a little bit differently? How do you find the right guys that are active? And this is a point Darren Simmons made when he was talking to Jeff, Jeff Hobson for Bengals.com. How do you find the right guys on your game day active? roster to, to put out on the kickoff team where this is going to be a little bit different with different personnel and now this play mattering more than it did for the last several years so there are some I, roster building implications there as well for guys like marcus bailey for example who are still sure. out there and looking for a home and and chris evans i think this gives evans a shot now mm -hmm. before i'm not sure there would be one and there it's still a long shot but i think he has a shot it, show your you're the best kickoff returner in the on the team for then the for, for everyone who's been asking, why is Chris Evans still on the team if they're not going to use him? Well, maybe this is why. Maybe Darren Simmons had an idea this was coming. It, who knows? But rookie contract cheap knows the system. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of reasons why. Yeah, but not. to your point. There's no but, reason uh, not to have Chris Evans on the roster. Correct. All right, let's get to the worst thing I heard today. The NFL is having two Christmas Day games, and it's the dumbest thing ever. It's in the middle of the week on a Wednesday. And after one day after saying, oh, yeah, player safety and injuries – uh, they they want to play on a Wednesday, Jake. A Wednesday. And, and this kickoff rule. Same day. Player safety. Performative. I mean, there are some things that they can do to make player safety practically better with small changes and great if it works. But man, all this talk of player safety and we're pushing short weeks. More short weeks. I hate short weeks. Yeah, I, I loathe short weeks. You know what I, I hate more? And and I get it. Christmas Day is supposed to be an NBA holiday <laughs> where I don't have to talk about football for that day. No, sir. And so selfishly, it sucks. And I really like seeing you. I really hope the Bengals don't get a Christmas Day game. I like I that's a big one. That's a big one for me. I I, I hear you and I agree. Christmas Bengals still. PR, I promise I, I will not travel if that's a road game. I'm letting you know now ahead of time. I promise I'm not. I will not go to that game. Being on a Wednesday, also, what the f like, what the? F um, if it's a Saturday, like, okay, Sunday, well, duh, you're already playing on Sunday. Even Thursday, uh, because you play games on Thursday anyway. But late in the season, you're going to ask teams to play a short week because they're going to put teams on Saturday games into this Wednesday game. So you're going to put teams on a one day shortened week in the game prior to this Wednesday game. And then they're going to have a Thursday night schedule going into the Wednesday game after Saturday game. So you're going short week into short week and back-to-back -back weeks in December, late in the season, when they're high leverage games and your teams are beat up and you're worn down. I, I, I hate it for that reason. If, if there's a second buy involved and, and teams have more flexibility, you can schedule these short weeks around buys so they're not short weeks anymore, great. I, I hope that for the teams that play on Wednesday, at least they don't also have to play on Thursday. Because the idea of playing a Thursday night game early in the season and you have a short week, and then later you have to have a short week going into a Saturday game, and then you have a short week going into a Wednesday game again. Maybe you've also had a Monday night game that year. You had a short week going from a Monday to a Sunday. I don't like short weeks. I don't like rest inequality. And I know they're going to do some things. So this Wednesday game, at least there's a rest. The, the teams are coming off equal rest going into that game. But I think you're asking for – you're tempting fate, and, and it worries me. Uh, yeah. as someone who likes to see players healthy and playing at a high level. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And it it stinks for everyone. Even, even It's good for fans, arguably. Is it? I mean, it, 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 NBA fans love watching the NBA on Christmas, right? Sure. So th these games and the reason... Do you want to go to a stadium it, on Christmas? Well, the reason they're doing it is because these games drew, they said, record-breaking ratings. And so... They're doing it for the TV money, uh, just like they're doing the Peacock game for the TV money, just like no they're doing doubt. the Amazon playoff game for the for the TV money. And my, I guess that one, I get it. Two, money is king. it is. 
80% of that audience wasn't paying attention to the game. I know they don't care. That's background noise. Care. Even NBA on Christmas. I love it. It's background noise in between Christmas movies when I can sneak in sometimes. That's all that is. No one's going down any down. Now, the diehards will. The Locked on Bengals listeners will. But the casual NFL fan doesn't give a damn if it's Joe Burrow or LeBron. No, no, no. Because they're, they're it's I don't just know. background. It's uh, I, just think background. It, I think if the Bengals were playing on Christmas, it's going to be nighttime. It's going to be primetime games, I assume, or, or afternoon. They're not going to do Christmas morning. Me. I swear to God, if they play cr- nighttime on Christmas, oh my God. I'm not saying that I'm, I obviously don't want this either. I'm just saying that, like, I could see Bengals fans that are together with their families on Christmas, like, yeah, let's put the game on after dinner. Sure. I, Bengals fans, as yeah. in, like, not my neighbor that's just a casual, and I, I'm just bringing up. There's a big difference between a Bengals fan that's going to go to a game in the average fa- I, in the average fan that yeah they wear Bengals gear but it, I, there's a much there's a big difference there. That's I, I don't think they'd be doing it if it if it wasn't incredibly lucrative. Every decision they make, money is the bottom line. I just hate it for player safety and yeah for for obviously for for the players who you know have to stay in hotels and lose their their christmas week to a short week of of walkthroughs into a grueling game on a short week and obviously for for you guys on the beat as well that's uh it's not it's not nice it's not I'm nice a, for, for 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 those groups of people i'll keep my comments to myself as far as that's concerned no christmas day games roger there you go if there are any other rule changes trade deadline for example the being money. Moved, that, that we haven't covered okay. In addition to potential comments from Katie Blackburn, expecting to hear from her at some point down at the owners' meetings, we will cover those this week as well. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Until next time, thanks for listening. Hootay, and have a good one.